Each and every week here on the show, we ask informed and engaged members of the community to gather together here with me at the line table. We talk about big issues that face our state and look for innovative solutions. One of the things we are always looking for in line panelists are people who are open to having difficult discussions and also bring a diversity of perspectives and backgrounds to that conversation. Michael Burr definitely fits that bill. He was a past president of the American Public Health Association, the first Native American to ever hold that position. He has nearly three decades experience working in public health with a focus on medical social work, healthcare administration, and public health policy. Mr. Bird recently sat down with NMIF correspondent Megan Kamrick to talk about his legacy, which also includes the recent honor of being named one of the 75 most influential alumni of the past 75 years by the University of California, Berkeley. Michael Bird, thank you for joining us on In Focus in a different role. <laughs> <laughs> well, very happy to be here again in whatever role I'm, I can play. You were recently recognized by the UC Berkeley School of Public Health as one of their most, or 75 most influential alumni. What was it like to get that recognition? A bit of a surprise, um, but it made my mother very happy. So um, <laughs> as I have joked with some friends of mine, he said uh, I was uh, uh, sort of uh, really kind of seeking or thought I would end up on America's Most Wanted. <laughs> Um, so, so my mom was very grateful that uh, it was Berkeley and, and not America's Most Wanted. Um, no, it was a wonderful honor and um, I'm, I'm appreciative of Berkeley and the opportunities that have been provided and, um, and hope that they continue with their commitment to Native communities mm -hmm. in that regard um, because they do have a long-standing commitment to diversity and equity and, uh, and if if Indians and native populations aren't part of that, then um, it's, it's not really true. You grew up uh, in, you're from New Mexico, I should say, but you went to public school in Utah, which was where you were is pretty white and conservative. How did that experience shape you? Well, I think anytime you're outside of what you know and you're familiar with, um, you have to adapt and you have to, I think there's some, it causes some inner dialogue and maybe even some inner conflict as to because you're comparing different environments and different populations and different communities. Um, I guess to, to sum up what an African-American um, um, member of APHA told me when he heard I had... That's the American Public Health American Association. Public, yes. Mm -hmm. When he said, well, where have you been? What, what has been your experience? And I told him, well, I spent a lot of time in Utah. And he says, well, if, if you can survive that... <laughs> you've got my vote and if you, can, if you can do well there, then you can do well anywhere. And that kind of reframed the whole, uh, hmm. the whole my, my, my way of looking at things. So it helped build resilience or a sense of self? Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, if it's, it's like you find out if you can swim or not. And um, I'm not afraid of water. <laughs> After college, you went into social work. Why did you do that? Well, it, it was a very personal sort of choice, I think, that, um, well, two things. One is that there were funds that were available, scholarship funds. In, always important. In that area, resources, yeah. always. Um, and the other was that I came out of a, my father, an adult child of an alcoholic. My father had been challenged with that issue, um, eventually died of, died of it prematurely. Um, and it really shaped, again, was another experience that shaped my perspective on, on who I was and what I wanted to do. And I think that I felt like if I was dealing with that, that I had a better understanding of what the issue was, what the challenges were, and might be able to help um, other Native people. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, as I've grown older and had more experience, um, I've, it's become very clear to me that Indian people aren't the only ones who have problems. And that in do tell. <laughs> <laughs> that in fact might be able to offer a little assistance to my non-native brothers and sisters. What kind of work did you do as a social worker in New Mexico? I actually worked for four years at the Santa Fe Indian Hospital doing medical social work. It was a small 65-bed uh, hospital and so anything that came in the door from um, substance abuse patients to to seniors to um, child abuse, the whole the whole range of issues that a small hospital would see. 
and we served uh, the northern pueblos and, and southern pueblos here in New Mexico. And um, it, was, uh, it was very challenging, but I think it was uh, really the cornerstone of sort of a, my understanding of who I was and the people in the communities I was serving. What kinds of issues were Native American folks facing? This was in the 70s? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, high rates of substance abuse um, and accidents related oftentimes to, to substance abuse. Um, um, sometimes, in some cases, neglect of seniors, and in some cases, um, you know, children. Uh, but then the whole range of that you would see in any hospital, you mm -hmm. know, chronic conditions, uh, diabetes, um, um, oftentimes, uh, yeah, diabetes mm -hmm. and hypertension, the, m many of the similar conditions we s still are dealing with today. And you made a decision at some point to switch to public health and get a degree in that. Why did you decide to go that route? Well, it, in the role of social work, it's an important role. I applaud anybody who's in health care today, um, but it seemed somewhat limited. And I really wanted to be able to influence things on a larger level, more of a macro level. And Because um, public health is about prevention. Public health yeah. is prevention, and it's more upstream um, efforts versus downstream. Um, I, I felt like it was a revolving door in terms of the populations I was dealing with, and there was always a new patient, there was always a new crisis. And um, I just came to the conclusion that's not something I could deal with or wanted to deal with long term. And I wanted to be able to move into policy mm -hmm. and management. And um, so I pursued uh, the opportunity at Berkeley and Hawaii, actually. Oh, you're in Hawaii, too? Yeah. That was the best part of the Berkeley program. Oh, you got to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds pretty cush. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you were involved in the U.S. Public Health Office here in New Mexico, right. and you got very involved in the New Mexico Public Health Association and the American Public Health Association, you mentioned. Why did you want to do that? Well, I could do IHS, but it seemed it was important and good work, but it was rather narrow. It's the and Indian Health Service. Yeah, mm -hmm. just the Indian Health Service. And it, one of the things that was real clear to me, if we're going to be effective in anything we do, we have to work with a, a range of entities and outside, um, you know, oftentimes the state of New Mexico wasn't really communicating um, all that well or effectively with, with Indian Health Service in terms of the state health department. And so there wasn't the kind of collaborative efforts that, that you really need um, that need to take place if you're going to if you're going to make a difference here in New Mexico or any place else. Collaboration and partnerships are really the essence to success in public health. That's why they call it public health. Uh, I'm guessing in some of these instances, uh, meetings or gatherings with these organizations, you were one of the few Native folks in the room. Maybe I was wondering what that was like. <laughs> well, it's nothing new since my Utah experience. Um, yeah, I think that um, back then, and and even I would have to say probably in this day and age, um, I don't think there's enough um, uh, collaboration and engagement with Native communities, and I mean, and and real engagement, and that and that's when you're developing programs, when you're developing policy, and, and not not just when it plays out at the ground level, but I think there needs to be really uh, respectful, um, constructive engagement, and um, with communities with com to, with communities to understand what they need right yeah. all across the board, and um, and in those days, I yeah I think there were there were that not that many native people in 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 sort of the higher echelons of IHS even you know, locally as well as nationally. Um, how did how did your culture and your ancestry inform how you approached public health? Well, that's, you know, that's, that, that's a good question. The, when I went to Berkeley, it, it was really, just for example, when I went to Berkeley, the, um, they were talking about clean air, clean land, and clean water, which is sort of the basic elements of public health, and, and how it was all... Um, it was a, how it's a system that, that is all 
um, an ecological sort of approach to things. Like a holistic. Uh, yeah, yeah, holistic okay. and ecological. And, and it was like, you know, I mean, it, for some of the students that were in the class, they were going, oh my God, this is really, this is really interesting. I never, you know, I never really thought of things that way. And I was kind of like going, uh, what's, the, what's the big deal? I mean, that's kind of how I was already hardwired, just in terms of how I saw the world uh, from a holistic perspective, that all things are connected, all things are related, and all systems, biological, everything is, is really um, interconnected. And I think that the, that sort of perspective really is, is a part and parcel of, of an Indian wor a native indigenous worldview, that all things are connected. You were also executive director of the National Native American AIDS Prevention Center in Oakland. Um, what were some of the unique challenges that HIV has presented in Native communities? Well, we were serving three communities, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian. So there's a little bit of a challenge because although we're similar in many ways, there, there are differences because there's differences even in Indian communities. I think that was one thing. Um, I think a real commitment and real resources to that 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 area was was a significant challenge, um, and the federal government at that time, a number of the agencies, it was sort of a, a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Well, if this works for African Americans, then it works for everybody. If this works for Hispanic Latinos, it works for everybody, and um, they even even with leadership of color, uh, much less leadership that was Anglo or white, they didn't really understand the cultural differences, the, the historical differences, and the nuance that's important in developing and delivering programs that are going to be effective. And I mean, this was in Oakland, there were, was a really big urban native population, right? Pretty significant. From relocation right. efforts in the right. 50s and 60s. So. Right. It's not a small amount of people. No, no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Has any of that changed? You did this in the early 2000s. Has any of that changed or gotten better? I, I, th I well, there are a couple things. Some things have gotten better, some things not so much. But I think one of the things that I see that's really important is there are more native professionals, more native uh, with credentials in terms of PhDs or MDs. It's not enough, but there are more now than there ever were before. So. Back in those days, I mean, when I came back to New Mexico with a master's degree in social work, you could count the number of, mm. of Indian people who had social work degrees at a master's level on one hand. That kind of held for public health as well. Now, um, there are more, there, there, I think there are more programs. There, there are more Native people who are out there in the communities practicing and delivering programs and services. And hopefully there's more that's more integration with those non-native systems and more uh, commitment to native people than there were back in those days. How has public health improved since you first started and where are there still gaps? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, Sir Michael Marmot, who is also recognized by Berkeley, now he and I are bros, no, just kidding. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, 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 his construct of um, social determinants of health has really, I think, broadened the conversation mm. and really identified those factors that create healthy communities. And um, I think that's significant. I think there's also a lot more conversation about structural determinants of, of health. Those, those, those federal and, and national and state policies that either promote health or not, um, and, um, but I think there also needs to be a, a greater commitment to recognizing, um, as in the conversations we've had previously, um, one of the conversations is Native people are really largely invisible in, in many uh, of the conversations that take place across the country, and I dare say even in New Mexico, um, uh, because um, if you're really gonna, if you really have a commitment to diversity, if you really have a commitment to equity, then, then the first question you have to start out with is who's not here mm -hmm. and who's not represented. What are the misconceptions you find people still have about Native Americans and how does that affect issues of health and equity? Well, I think that, I think, you know, 
largely the non-Indian community, let me just say this and I'll try and be kind, is, is really largely ignorant of Indian history, Indian culture, and, and if you don't know the history of Indian people in this country today, then you really don't understand who we are and, and the challenges we face. Um, and also the importance that the land plays to Native people. This, this, I mean, this to this day is Native land. Everything, the whole, the whole genesis of how Native people see the world is predicated on place and, and the relationship to land. Um, I think for non-Native people, who are all immigrants, um, most of their, their mythology and their belief system ties back to the Middle East and Adam and Eve. Um, for Native teachings, mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's and, and that may explain to some degree, I think, an alienation and a lack of understanding of what, what is here and who's here. Well, the idea of public health, as you said, is to go upstream right. and focus on prevention. And Native people here in the Southwest and around the world have faced genocide, relocation, decimation of culture, yet you're still here. Um, what can they teach us that the rest, how, what can they teach the rest of the world about what a healthy society is and what it looks like? Well, I have the perfect quote. So, so, um, Stephen Hawking, the British mm -hmm. astrophysicist, was quoted as saying, um, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. And I would say that Native people have adapted to more change in the past 500 years. And to your point, we're still here. So I think there's some value in having an acknowledgement and recognition that we have survived. And we have survived because there, there are certain sort of principles that have been in play that have allowed us to survive and to continue and, and in many cases thrive. Um, we're, we're, we are, um, you know, the word resilient has been used too much, I think. Mm -hmm. I think um, the, the, there are lessons the, re the reason we're still here is because we've we figured out how to survive. We've figured out how to adapt. We have figured out um, how, to, how to survive in a, in a constantly changing environment. That might be helpful in the future. <laughs> right? We might not have a future mm -hmm. if we don't begin to understand and, and, and learn something from people who've, in fact, survived much. As you say, a lot of uh, American Indians, Native Americans are sort of invisible in our culture. Um, how have you tried to change that with your work? Well, I, I'm past president of the American Public Health Association, 2001, the first American Indian. Um, I've tried to knock on the door and get in the door and remind people we're still here and that we have something to offer in terms of our philosophy, our perspective, our beliefs. Um, I did that with, the, with AARP. I, I served six years on the National Policy Council of AARP. Again, I was the first Indian that had ever served. Um, and that's an organization that's committed to diversity mm -hmm. and equity as well. Um, and there were things that uh, when I showed up, it's like, uh, okay, we've got a box for everybody else. Now an Indian walks in, what, what, what do we do? Where do we put him? How do we... How do we? It, it sort of felt like they'd they'd had they'd had everything figured mm -hmm. out until I showed up, and I think that it's really important. It's challenging for Native people to have to step out of being comfortable because it's a lot more comfortable just to stay here in New Mexico. Well, it goes back to you can you're going to go be the only one in the room, yes, and be the first, and 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 have to remind people and teach people, hopefully who are, are open and want to learn some of the things that they need to know if they're going to be not only effective with native people but if they're going to be effective with the with the with the world and and the worldwide community what are we losing by not having these viewpoints at the table making decisions on policy or a range of other areas well i think there's a i think native people clearly because of 500 some years 
of, and, and we've actually been on this continent anywhere from, they say, 15, and now pushing back the 15 to 20,000 years. So I think there's some wisdom there. I think there's some understanding of what it takes to survive. I think there's better understanding of what kind of relationship we need to have with the earth um, and the elements, water, land, and, and, um, and what does it take to build relationship, not only with the earth, but with each other's mm -hmm. to survive. Mm -hmm. um, what I see happening in this country today is that there are people who place more value on things than they do people and humanity. I don't think that that's perspective that native indigenous, that's part of native and indigenous thought, that there is an importance on the relationship that all things are connected, all things are related, and it all has a place and a role. I don't see that in Western society. When you're making these inroads to say like, hey, you're missing this voice, these can be uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> What would you say to people who, who want to engage in this, but it's uncomfortable, so how do we do this? Get over it. Okay. <laughs> no. That's no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, it, there are a lot of things, things don't get better by ignoring them. As a, as a, you know, I mean, therapy, basic therapy, and having done medical social work and as a therapist, it, you don't, things do not get, or get better by themselves. The, the best way to deal with any issue and any discomfort is to, is to put it on the table and have a respectful mm -hmm. conversation, a respectful dialogue. And um, I think we, I would hope that we all could do that. I mean, we're supposed to be quote on adults and, and professionals in many, in, in, in many arenas and um, things do not get better by ignoring them. You have to have an honest conversation. And there are those of us who around who are more than willing to do that. Well, Michael Bird, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. I appreciate the time. And 